it's Naharika with yet again another SAT biology video. So today we're going to be talking about both the nervous system and the endocrine system and these are honestly the bigger ones that you need to know. I'm not really going to go into like male and female reproduction too much or your digestive system, anything like that. It's not really extremely pertinent to the test but I think these two are ones worth reviewing. So we're going to start with the nervous system, which consists of billions of nerve cells called neurons, and they're specialized and they carry impulses, so this is not a typical cell. Although these don't look like typical cells, and it's because I just said they're not typical cells, they have a cell body, which is also called a soma, but it contains your normal organelles, so your nucleus, your ribosomes, your mitochondria, and a bunch of other things. And the processes or extensions, these are technical terms for those weird little branches that come out of the cell body, those are called dendrites. And the axon is that one long guy. And so usually neurons only have one axon but a bunch of dendrites. Now a neuron will receive its impulse from the dendrites and transmit it through the axon. So impulses usually go in one way. When a neuron is resting, due to the chemical gradient inside and outside the cell, we can say that the neuron is polarized because the inside is negative and the outside is positive. And this is the resting membrane potential. And this is super important to remember. It's usually around negative 70 millivolts. But this idea of polarization is what makes the cell actually conduct these impulses. So we're going to get into the chemistry a little bit of it. Protein channels within the cell membranes of neurons help create this concentration gradient because remember they're involved in active and passive diffusion and they in our cases act as pumps and active transport actively transport sodium out of the cell. Now the first membrane protein we're going to look at is called a sodium potassium pump or a sodium potassium ATPase which requires one molecule of ATP to move three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions in. The second protein we're going to look at is called a leak channel, a potassium leak channel, because it's always open and this will allow the, allow the potassium to leak out of the cell passively based on diffusion. When all of these positive ions are going out of the cell and the sodium ions are being pumped out, so you have your potassium through the leak channels, your sodium actively transported, now the inside is relatively more negatively charged to the outside. Now the other type of channel you need to know about is called a voltage-gated channel, which is pretty much what it sounds like. It'll only open when it reaches a certain threshold potential. And the two types of voltage-gated channels you need to know about are the sodium voltage-gated channels and the potassium voltage-gated channels. So now we're going to discuss the steps of an actual action potential. And an action potential is when enough stimuli is accumulated to send an impulse down the neuron. So this begins with an excess of sodium on the outside and an excess of potassium within. Even though some of the potassium gets out through the leak channels, we still consider there to be more potassium inside the cell. Now when the cell potential reaches negative 50 millivolts, the sodium voltage-gated channel opens and sodium rushes into the cell. Now this is called depolarization because we're actually passively diffusing sodium in, this isn't any active transport, and this is getting it back to equilibrium. Now the inside of the cell is actually extremely positive because you have this huge rush of sodium in, and now the potassium voltage-gated channels open, so potassium floods out of the cell. So now the cell becomes more negative again, slowly, and this is called repolarization. Once the cell reaches negative 90 millivolts, the potassium voltage-gated channel closes and the sodium-potassium ATPase and the potassium leak channels are open, and this will temporarily restore the balance that we originally had. Some neurons are wrapped in Schwann cells, and these are also called myelin sheaths, and the spaces between each Schwann cell is called a node of Ranvier, and these are actually really important terms because what this myelin sheath does is it'll increase how fast the impulse can be transferred because now instead of going down this long axon you're actually just jumping from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier and this process from node to node is called saltatory conduction 
One last thing to remember is that there is a tiny bit of time when the neuron has to reset to its resting potential, and during this time called the refractory period, an impulse can't be fired, because we're not polarized yet, so we can't get depolarized yet, and the whole thing just can't happen. Now, the point where an impulse gets transferred to either another neuron or to an organ is called the synapse. So this is at the end of one neuron connecting to either another neuron, other organ. So most synapses use neurotransmitters to pass the impulse on, and the most common neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Remember that one for the test, it's really important. Remember that the structure of a synapse is basically a gap between two neurons, and the gap is called the synaptic cleft. And on the end of an axon, this is where the neurotransmitters are contained, and then the dendrites from the other, let's say it's a neuron on an organ, from the other neuron can bind to those transmitters. Neurotransmitters are released via exocytosis, you should know what that is, and it diffuses, the neurotransmitters will diffuse to the next cell. Typically, receptors on the second neuron are connected to ion channels, and this allows for an action potential to occur. And remember, if these receptors were connected to sodium channels, then with enough depolarization, you could reach the, th the threshold for voltage-gated channels to open, and you could have another action potential right there. However, not all neurotransmitters stimulate or, like, want another action potential to occur. So these guys are called inhibitory inputs. And so the way the neuron figures out whether it's going to fire or not is through summation, is whether they have more stimulatory or more inhibitory inputs. Remember, all action potentials are exactly alike. You can't have a stronger action potential than something else because every single one just needs to cross this one threshold line, and after it does that, you're good to go. You have the same action potential every time. But now you're thinking, okay, if I just got like a paper cut versus if I'm having my leg amputated, how come if it's the same action potential, why does my leg probably hurt like 10,000 times more? And so the reason that this occurs is based on the frequency, how often this action potential is happening. So when you get a paper cut, it's definitely not having an action potential as often as you would be. This is the weirdest example of your leg being amputated. So now we're going to get way bigger than at the cellular level. We're going to talk about the nervous system on a macro level. So the nervous system is split into two parts. That's the central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, and all other neurons are part of the peripheral nervous system. So basically everything else that isn't the brain or the spinal cord is part of the PNS. Within the peripheral nervous system, sensory neurons, which send information to the central nervous system from the sensory organs, and it also contains motor neurons, which send information from the brain and the spinal cord to the muscles and glands. Now, in the central nervous system, they only work with interneurons, not the sensory or the motor, and interneurons basically just connect the sensory and the motor together. So now we're going to break down the central nervous system. So the spinal cord is involved in primitive reflex actions and the cerebrum, which is where we have our conscious awareness of our sensations and certain voluntary actions. This is all the pink stuff in your brain. It's important and it makes up your central nervous system. The other components you want to know about are the cerebellum, associated with muscle movement and balance, your medulla, which takes on all your involuntary acts, such as breathing, the hypothalamus, which maintains body homeostasis and controls the pituitary gland, which is important for the endocrine system. Now we're going to divide the PNS, which is made up of the somatic nervous system and the autonomic. The somatic is voluntary, and whenever you think somatic, think skeletal muscles only, the S and the S. This nervous system uses acetylcholine to stimulate skeletal muscle. Now the ANS is in involuntary, and it includes organs like the heart. The ANS can be divided into the sympathetic division, which increases your body activity, and the parasympathetic division, which decreases your body activity. The sympathetic will help prepare the body for high-stress situations, so it'll raise your blood pressure, your heartbeat, breath rate, and the chemical, the neurotransmitter you want to associate with this, is norepinephrine. Now, with the parasympathetic division, this is associated with the phrase rest and digest, and it decreases your heartbeat and blood pressure and breath rate, so it's basically the opposite, and the primary neurotransmitter you want to associate with this guy is acetylcholine. 
Next, we're going to talk about the endocrine system. So endocrine glands produce hormones which then circulate the body via the blood. So your hormones are pretty much all over your blood, all over your body, all the time. The pituitary gland controls many other endocrine glands, so that's basically the head of this whole deal. And it's made up of the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. Now the anterior pituitary gland makes and secretes growth hormone, which targets all your tissues and organs, causes them to grow. You should remember cell turnover rate, which is how often new cells replace your old ones when you associate or think about growth hormone. Next we have thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimulates your thyroid gland to secrete even more hormones. Next you have your adrenocorticotropic hormone, which stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete, again, even more hormones. Next, you have your follicle-stimulating hormone, which targets the reproductive organs. So in females, it will cause the ovomaturation and the release of estrogen. And in males, it will stimulate the creation of sperm. Luteinizing hormone stimulates the ovaries in females and the testes in males to make testosterone. Prolactin stimulates the mammary glands to make breast milk. Now, for every single hormone that the anterior pituitary will release, there's a corresponding releasing hormone that the hypothalamus releases first. Because remember, the hypothalamus pretty much controls everybody, so this releases a hormone to the pituitary gland, and then the pituitary gland will release it to everywhere else. Now, the posterior pituitary gland stores and secretes two hormones, oxytocin, which causes the uterus to contract during childbirth, and the mammary glands to release milk, and the antidiuretic hormone, which is also called vasopressin, and this causes the kidneys to retain water. The thyroid gland will secrete your thyroid hormone, which is known as, or your thyroid hormones, known as thyroxin and calcitonin. Your thyroxin makes the body cells increase their rate of metabolism, and if you don't have enough of it, you have hypothyroidism, and the effect of people have really low metabolic rates, and the opposite is hyperthyroidism, which symptoms include a really fast heartbeat and weight loss, understandably. Calcitonin stimulates cells in the bone to remove calcium from the blood and build new bone, so this reduces your blood calcium levels. Now, there are four parathyroid glands in the body found on the back of your thyroid gland, and they secrete parathyroid hormone, which is also known as parathormone, and its purpose is to release calcium into the blood by dissolving bone, which is super weird to think about. You don't think about your bones being dissolved, but that's kind of what this does. And the reason we have these two hormones dedicated just to calcium is because calcium is really important in your nerve impulse conduction, heart contraction, blood clotting, and a bunch of other bodily functions. Now we're going to talk about your adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidney, and they are made up of the adrenal medulla and adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline, and, it's a, and it secretes norepinephrine. The adrenal cortex secretes steroids, and these come in three major classes. Glucocorticoids have the target being their liver, which causes the liver to produce glucose from fats and proteins and release it into the blood. Now this process is called gluconeogenesis. Mineral corticoids have the kidney as their target and their primary mineral corticoid is aldosterone which causes the kidneys to retain sodium and in turn this also will cause the body to retain water so this increases both the blood pressure and volume. Sex steroids are also secreted but these hormones aren't that important because the hormones from the gonads are really what you should be focusing on in regards to sex hormones. Now, the pancreas secretes hormones and many digestive enzymes, like we talked about earlier. The pancreas secretes insulin and glucagon, and these hormones are produced by the islet cells. Insulin is secreted when blood glucose levels are high, and they stimulate the liver to store glucose as glycogen. Glucagon is the opposite like exactly the opposite. So whenever blood glucose is low, it will be released, causing the liver to break down glycogen, and this process is called glycogenolysis. Gonads produce and secrete steroids, and they're collectively called the sex steroids. Male gonads produce androgen, and the primary androgen is testosterone, which is responsible for male secondary sex characteristics. The ovary produces estrogen and progesterone. The most common form of estrogen is estra estradiol. Estrogen and progesterone are responsible for developing 
female secondary sex characteristics and regulating the menstrual cycle. Estrogen stimulates the growth of the uterine lining in the first half of the cycle, and progesterone maintains it in the second half.